When we were making fun of the BBC, which we used to do a lot, <laughs> you'd always be like, their leader is four years old. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> that's sing-songy. Oh, that is. Yeah, that's yeah. it. But Great. for now, time will tell. That's Roman Mars imitating the BBC. Well, Avery... This has been a great conversation. <laughs> I thank go. you for your time. <laughs> that and so much more coming right up on today's episode of The Pod Spotter. Hi, you're listening to yet another riveting conversation on the pod spotter, you lucky dog. Have you um have you seen the number of podcasts out there? Okay, don't don't even look. Just meet me here every Monday. I'll have a brand new podcast for you to slip on and try out before you drive it off the lot. And hopefully you find uh that conversation useful or entertaining. I hope it inspires you. And if it does, tell people to subscribe to our pod. Word of mouth really helps. Uh, visit thepodspotter.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Podspotter for extra content and info on upcoming shows. Thank you. Twitter, Instagram. It's really a pleasure. I've been screening hundreds of podcasts. You all have at least one item. That article of clothing tucked deep in the closet you'll absolutely never wear again, yet can't seem to throw away. For many, it's a wedding dress. For others, an old shirt you met someone special in. For me, it's a t-shirt with eagles on the shoulders that I wore once because I was ridiculed incessantly for the entire evening. But I loved it, and it remains because it serves as a record of a specific time and place. And that's all fashion is a record of what was fashionable to you and to society as a whole. A record of the fashion of the past two years will reveal the great pajama boom. Joggers and loungewear are king. But if the roaring 20s of the previous century are any indication, the next 10 years will see a fashion transformation the likes of which we haven't seen in over a century. Coming off the heels of the previous pandemic, dresses got shorter, corsets discarded, and evening wear was bedazzled with sequins. To understand why, we look at the historical context of the times. Not only was the Spanish flu wrapping up, but World War I had ended, and more women than ever were entering the workforce. They sought a comfortable lifestyle and fashion that reflected the ushering in of the new modern age. Why we wear the things we wear have deep roots in history. Fashion doesn't exist in a vacuum. Everything in the design world has purpose and influence. At least that's what I learned this week from Miss Avery Truffleman, host of the podcast Articles of Interest, a 12-part series about what we wear and why we wear it. In each episode, Avery tackles the historical context behind everything from Hawaiian shirts to pockets to your favorite pair of blue jeans. Each episode woven delicately into the next like the colorful tartan of a Scottish kilt. Yeah, she she covers kilts too, by the way. Articles of interest at face value is theme-based storytelling, but as you examine the craftsmanship closer, you'll realize that each episode fits perfectly to create a -a one-of-a-kind ensemble. Remove any one episode and the entire outfit crumbles. Articles of interest was named the best podcast of the year by BBC, Curbed, Globe Mail, LAS, New York Magazine. Oh my, this is too many. This is too many. But uh, listen, if you are still not convinced to subscribe, I suppose you can stick around for my chat with Avery Truffleman. Thank you for being here, Avery. And thank you for sharing the pod with us today. How are you? Oh my God, what a gorgeous introduction. I was having such a bad day and I totally needed that. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, it's all from you. It's all, it's everything I learned from my week of binging your pod, I, I'm wearing a, a nice vest today in spirit of uh, in spirit of your podcast. I, uh, and a chambray I shirt. Up. You like yeah. that? Yeah, I thanks le- for yeah, noticing, yeah, yeah. Megan. You. I didn't even yeah. know that was the name of this. <laughs> my goodness. Uh, why don't we start with an introduction, though, Avery? Uh, how do you introduce yourself at Fashion Week? Oh, God. Uh, well, 
Hi, my name is Avery Truffleman. I am a podcaster. I'm currently at The Cut uh, and New York Magazine. And for the last seven years of my life, I worked uh, for the design and architecture podcast 99% Invisible, which is where I made Articles of Interest. And uh, Articles of Interest is is your baby. You You wrote, produced, did the whole thing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It was really, I mean, truly like a one-man band. I mean, I was very generously supported by my former boss, Roman Mars. Right. You know, I was more or less traveling around the world with a backpack and a microphone, just talking to as many people as I possibly could. And then um, my my friend and collaborator, Ray Royal, makes the music, and I would work with them on creating a soundtrack that fits and then I would place the music and I mean, I had um, definitely like the team at 99% Invisible would lend their ears and give notes. And uh, I had help with mastering and mixing from Sharif Youssef. But other than that, it was just like my, my child. It was totally my baby. And yeah. how, how do you describe your baby to people who haven't yet listened to it? Well, I always thought of it as a fashion show for non-fashion people. Because I am not a, I was not, now I am a fashion person after doing these 12 episodes. But before that, I was not a fashion person. And I think a lot of it came from working for 99% Invisible, which is all about the design and intention of our built environments. I spent years learning about manhole covers and fire escapes and concrete and just like the things all around our world. And I was like, oh, clothing is a part of this. It's not this separate sort of Zoolander world. It's a choice we're making every single day. To think that clothing doesn't touch us or it's like fashion is not a part of our world is um, misogyny. It just, it's not mm. true. You know, yeah. we all have to engage with it. Even the people who don't think they do. Even um, the people yeah. like me who are like, no, I'm just going to throw on a Henley. It doesn't matter. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I am actually making a conscious decision. I'm thinking about it. That was made by someone. It was deliberate. Totally. Really Even as you said, yeah. Like when, you, when you're like, oh, I'm just going to wear my pajamas today. Or I'm just going to wear my sweats today. That's a choice you made. You know, every, yeah. not making a choice is a choice. Like it's all fashion. Yeah. People don't realize it's fantasy. There's always this thing that you have to work extra hard to get. Mm. And that's so good. No one dresses like a king anymore. How do you make money? That's how I make money, love. There are lots of things that we take for granted that would once have been considered luxuries. Avery, you were destined to be on the show in one form or another. We were going to have you on either. You're, you're involved in so many podcasts. We love Nice Try here. Also, oh. we love your Utopia episode. Folks should check that out also. But I mean, 99% visible, like you said, it's an institution. I mean, that's what I mean. Top, top, that's royalty yeah. in these parts. So um, just uh, being associated that with is obviously awesome. But what did Roman Mars, what does he promote that that has created and influenced some of the best podcasts that we have out there. I don't even know where to begin with. I mean, he taught me everything. Like he took right. me under his wing as a 22 year old intern and he literally kickstarted my career. Someone asked me like, what's a lesson you learned from Roman Mars? I was just like, a lesson? I don't know. Like I, everything I know, I know from him. Um, <laughs> but I think fundamentally the reason he's impacted so many people, I think it really comes down to respect. He really respects the listener. He's like, you are smart. You can handle this. I'm not going to dumb this down for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then I think Roman really was one of the pioneers of podcasting in that he was like, you selected this program. You want to be here. And I'm going to talk to you like you chose, like you chose this. You want to get nerdy? Like we're going to get nerdy. Mm. But I think Roman was one of the first people to really talk to um, extremely niche academics and architects and designers like a human. And he always talked about the show as like a design column. He was like, it's very important that we also have an opinion and a perspective. It's not just facts. And I think that also shaped a lot of the way I make stories and a lot of the way many other people kind of in the children of Roman Mars category make stories. I want to play um, the Vivian Westwood quote that you play on your pod that led to you choosing this story and telling this story. Vivian Westwood is one of the most famous clothing designers in the world now. I mean, she's huge. She doesn't have the time to speak to me for this podcast. But she is the reason why I wanted to talk about clothing. Because in 2009, I heard her say this thing to the New York Times, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since. 
The paradox is that people think that if they wear something simple and non-saying, that somehow they themselves will emerge all the more stunning and beautiful from it. It's not true. It might be true. No, not, not even true of Christy Turlington. You know, no, no. I don't want to see Christy Turlington in a T-shirt and jeans. She can... Why not if you're born you know, somebody, a freak of beauty, why not, you know, look like a goddess? Why not? So, Avery, where were you when you heard that quote and why did it let you on fire? Oh, it's kind of, that's, oh, great question. It's a long answer, um, but I'll, I'll condense, I'll condense. This is long-form um, conversations here. You're fine. Okay. All right. We have uh, editors. We have editors. <laughs> <laughs> That was from an exhibit at the De Young Museum in San Francisco. And my uh, my aunt and my grandmother lived in San Francisco, and I grew up going there just like every summer. We'd go visit my, my aunt and my grandma. Mm. I would go to thrift stores on Haight Street, and they had these incredible, ridiculous thrift stores where I, I mean, I dressed like a freak. I went to an extremely... Um, preppy private school for high school. And (laughs) I don't even know what force of nature like compelled me to do this. I think I felt so weird and I felt so like I didn't belong that I would spend these summers and these breaks in San Francisco and I would go thrift shopping and I would come back with just like frilly uh, Victorian blouses, uh, Poochie-esque mini dresses, checkered pants, just like absurd, ridiculous outfits. And that was always the highlight. I was, I didn't have uh, many friends in high school. And so a huge part of my life was like planning my outfits and it de- like the teachers loved me, but students definitely like it did not win me many friends among my, my colleagues, but I don't know why I felt this need to like do that. And then when I went to college, I kept dressing up in this way. Wow. I went to an extremely, uh, extremely, radical liberal arts school where everyone was kind of trying to dress mm. um, in an interesting way. But you had years of experience on them. <laughs> I had years of experience. And also I think I was just a little too much. You said none of your other friends were, were inspired or egging this on. It was a one-upsmanship just with yourself. So one of the experts that I talked to in season two of Articles of Interest, Derek Guy, he's incredible. He's one of my favorite fashion journalists. He said this beautiful thing that was like clothing exists in a context, right? And like Harry Styles can wear a purple feather boa on a stage. But if you wear a purple feather boa on the street, people don't know what to make of it. It doesn't have the accurate Mm. context. You know, if you wear a cowboy boot. You're referencing something, right? You're like, I have taken this Western style and now it's this. You're speaking a language. The metaphor that Derek Guy made that I thought was so beautiful is he he was like, when you're making an outfit, you're making a sentence and it has to make grammatical sense. If you're making a statement just to make it, it's almost like the Noam Chomsky idea that you can craft a sentence that is grammatically correct, but doesn't have any meaning, like colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And so I was wearing these outfits that were just kind of loud And the message I was sending before in my old context was just like, I'm different. But Mm. now in this society where everyone was trying to communicate with each other in different ways, I was just yelling, colorless green ideas, sleep furiously. Like I wasn't (laughs) in tune and it alienated people. And I think it made, I think there was an idea around campus of just like, who does she think she is? And so I had this um, moment where I was like, oh my God, I just have to, you know, my clothes are hiding me. And then on one of my trips to San Francisco, I went to the de Young Museum and there was this retrospective of the work of Vivian Westwood, who I'd never heard of. But then when I went to this exhibit, that's when I learned who Vivian Westwood was and learned that she had designed punk, that someone had to design it. It wasn't just some grassroots movement that like happened, you know, someone made, made this happen. Uh, conscientiously. And that was sort of the seed of Articles of Interest. But what she said there really spoke to me, which is one of the things that's so fascinating about clothing. It is truly the membrane between our interior selves and our exterior selves. Like that is what we are navigating when we decide what to wear every day. And it plants the seed uh, way back then of Articles of Interest, um, which sends you on this 12-part series, this 12-part journey that begins 
um, <laughs> with one of the episodes that I can't get out of my head that I've been thinking about constantly because I have a 14 month old and I spend a lot of time in playgrounds and around kids and seeing kids fashion. And so like, I've been just so annoying, like with other parents of like, you know, I know why that bow is on that shirt. I know why that bright star <laughs> is on that shirt in kids clothing. Uh, we learned so much, uh, but the the thing that blew my mind was just the great lengths that uh, manufacturers go to to make kids' clothing um, <laughs> safe and make sure that kids don't sleep in clothing because if they sleep in the clothing, then it's a hazard potentially. Which means that kids' clothing, if it's not sleepwear, has to go through great pains to prove that it's not sleepwear so that they don't have to meet all those flammability and size requirements. So let's say you're trying to design kids' clothes that are not for sleeping. They can't have pictures of anything that could be interpreted as sleepy. Like what is pictured on it? Is it sleeping animals? Is it a sleepy scene? Does that make you feel sleepy? If it makes you feel sleepy, it's sleepwear. So no images of the moon, no images of stars, and no clouds. You know, like a cloud thing with Hollywood wouldn't work. Your legal department at your company would be like, you can't do that because that makes me feel like sleep. My daughter has this awesome onesie that I love on her. She looks so good in it, but it's this big, bright, goofy heart, like giant glowing in the center. I'm like, why did they do? <laughs> why is that? Everything else was great about this. And why that? And now I understand it's saying, don't sleep in this because I did not make it safe for a uh, fire. <laughs> basically, Yes. <laughs> that yes. is mind blowing. I didn't know. Yes. I, I, there is a reason for tchotchkes on kids clothes. What yes. else was exciting for you about uh, kids clothes and, and diving into that topic? You know, the interesting thing about it is like all the topics sort of interconnect in these weird ways once you really start to think about them. So like there's another episode um, that I did about pockets and like why women's clothes have no pockets and um, why men's clothes have such big and plentiful pockets. And in response to that, a lot of people are like, my baby's clothes have pockets. It's like, well, this is why it's to prove that it's day wear. Like your kid doesn't own items that fit in their pockets. Like it's, it's all this elaborate risk to be like, Oh, don't sleep in it. This is day wear. So like, once you start, once you have this lens of like, Oh, they need to show that this is not for sleeping and that this is for the day. It gives you this lens where you can look at kids clothes and just understand. Suddenly you can start to think like a designer and be like, Oh, that's, that's why. Other parents, they don't care that you have this knowledge, by the way. I'll I'll tell you that right now. (laughs) Oh yeah, that lapel, day wear. That's day wear. Okay, get away from me, weirdo. Uh, I mean, that's not going to stop me. Yeah. I'm still excited to know that new knowledge. I'm still happy to have it. <laughs> you know, you mentioned uh, kids wear lead to pockets. Pockets l- l- leads you um, to kilt, to tartan. I, I, that timeline, was that, did you have uh, a, a blueprint laid out for that? Or were you? did you start with kids wear and that led to, oh, that's interesting. I should go there. I should go here. Was it... Um, the did the story unravel or did you have the sort of mock up of the dress made? I'm going to use a lot of clothing metaphors. Yes, you can, they're inevitable with this series. Oh, like, oh, you're weaving lot, them right? together yes. and like <laughs> All right. common thread. I thought I had expired uh, most of them or used used up my budget uh, in the intro, <laughs> but I have like five or six more. No, no, no. Let keep them coming. Yeah. Um, it definitely began with. Uh, kids clothes. And that was like my little pilot that I've been thinking of for a long, long time. I've been slowly percolating that story idea. I mean, even before I got the green light to go Mm. ahead and make this series, I find with most of my stories, the way that I go about it is just sort of when I have something that makes me curious, I just start talking about it and talking about it with people at parties, talking about it with friends and little pieces start to come out of the woodwork and they coalesce. Mm. And so it's sort of started with kids clothes. And I was like, oh, this is a great idea for a series. Like talk to someone who has a question and a problem, talk to a manufacturer, talk to a historian to really get to every angle of this garment. And that's when I started thinking of like, what else am I curious with? And that's why so many of the episodes begin with a friend of mine, because Mm -hmm. these were people who at least have been thinking about these questions and talking about them with me for a long time. Like Sarah, who started the Hawaiian shirt story, she wrote this article, this very like bombastic article for KQED about like, we should abolish, oh, she wrote it for SF MoMA. It was like, we should abolish the tiki bar. And it became this huge <laughs> scandal. And I was like, wonder how Sarah feels about Hawaiian shirts. And asked her about that. And my friend Piers, who started the pocket story, like he had been thinking about pockets forever. As I say in the, in the series, 
there was this one night in college where I lent him a dress and it didn't have pockets. And he was so unused to not having pockets. He just like didn't know what to do with his keys. He got locked out of our dorm. Um, so these all, like all these origins, and like my friend Anna, who started the plaid story, she was like, are plaids like a gay thing? Like, did, is that, can you tell someone's gay if they're wearing plaids? Like all of these questions have been ideas that I've been thinking about with my friends for a long time. So I made the kids clothes first and then I made the rest of them all simultaneously. And I had this studio in East Oakland that I rented that was like literally the size of a closet. And I painted the wall with chalkboard paint. And I did this totally like a beautiful mind thing yes. where I was like laying them out. <laughs> the and, like, cop rearranging after the them. serial killer thing? No, oh, to- saying, totally. Yeah. Like definitely Five the serial killer meme. Yeah, like uh, and, uh, being like, because cool. I really wanted to make sure they all connected. I really wanted there to be oh, thematic yeah. links for all of them. I worked very hard. When people- <laughs> It's very <laughs> clear because it plays like a scavenger hunt. The end of every Thank episode, you. like we talk- um, uh, on the show, like I'll direct people to this episode or that episode, but you should definitely start at square one with this one. It is not like other podcasts. It plays like at the end of one, there's a clue for the next. And it's like you have to conquer one episode before you can move on to the next. And it's just uh, it's it's just exciting to listen in that way because I don't remember it being done like that before. Thank you so much for saying that. You mentioned Hawaiian shirts, and that was uh, definitely one article of interest that I was like, I didn't know I was interested in this until uh, you made it interesting. We introduced the idea to human resources departments that you could let your workers come to work dressed one day a week in something a little bit more casual, Dockers, for instance. And with Dockers, Levi's really created the concept of business casual wear, which they then sold to businesses. We took the idea to human resources departments. In fact, we created a kit, how to put casual business wear to work. And we sent thousands around to HR departments. And in it, it included a guide to what was appropriate wear. And in this guide that we're looking at, here's a man dressed in his docker slacks and a collared shirt and other clothing that he could wear. Aloha Friday came from Hawaii. But Casual Friday came from Levi Strauss and Company. Can you explain that link from uh, Aloha Friday to 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 Casual Fridays to, <laughs> for people oh who haven't heard this before? Because I was blown away by the fact that I don't that, know if I'm going to do a good job anymore. Like honestly, I haven't listened to this yeah. series in so long, and listening to me now, like gasping at, <laughs> as the as the Levi Strauss historian like shows me this pamphlet. I'm like, wow, get a hold of yourself. <laughs> Um, Get out of here. I love that. It's enthusiasm. That's the thing we love about your podcast. I often interview people who are, it's, there are two podcasters. It's, there are hosts and then there are just, there are people who live it. And it is clear that you live your, uh, your (laughs) podcast. Um, I love, we, we love when you are, when you are blown away by something, but basically we learn, I'll I'll tell let me tell you about it. Let me me explain your podcast (laughs) for you. Now on Fridays in Hawaii, people, uh, people would wear their Aloha shirts, uh, and, and Aloha shirts have significance about, you know, where they are and what they're located. And there would be birds and, and plants and things on their shirt that were specific to a time and place wh- where they lived. It had history. And and because Dockers was on the West Coast and they would vacation there a lot, they would see that people were wearing Hawaiian shirts on Fridays. And then Dockers like implemented this by like attacking HR, uh, like different corporate offices and saying, let's dress everyone down in America on Fridays as a way to sell more casual clothing because they just wanted to sell more clothes. Which is another has another level of insidiousness to it, right? It's like, oh, you don't need to give your employees like more benefits or like paternity <laughs> leave or anything. If you let them dress down, they love that shit. We're coming for you, Casual Friday. You're getting canceled. <laughs> Um, well, it was nice to uh, jog your memory there and see what you were able to recall from your own podcast. It gives yeah. me hope for our next segment, a uh, very popular game that we play here. Everyone's talking about it, Sweeping the Nation. How well do you know your pod? Avery Truffleman, I'm going to ask you three questions about your podcast. Oh if you answer <laughs> two out of three correctly, this Articles of Interest clipboard, which was sent to me, it's very, oh. very, it's very Tim Gunn. This clipboard of articles of interest will make it <laughs> on the pod wall of swag behind me. Three questions Amazing. about your podcast. Are you ready for how well do you know your pod? Okay. Why do female police officers wear men's uniforms and not female uniforms? The pockets are too small. The pockets are too small. Let's have a listen. Are you ready for this? I'm ready for this. <laughs> the women wear the mint. 
Really? Because the pockets are too small on the women's. Wait, really? That's yeah, why? that is why. But there is a women's that they make. But I don't carry them. Well, I've got some over here. But traditionally, they use the men's because the pockets are bigger. <gasps> and they can put things in them where the women's are smaller, which I can show you. Yes. And they won't fit. That's fascinating. Now you have something to blog about. I'll give you something to blog about. I had to play it. I knew it was a softball. Too excited. I, I knew it was a softball, but I had to play it. It's the best, it's the best piece of audio. You're so excited. And this guy, <laughs> first of all, like, come on, pal. It, it's amazing. You're doing a piece. You're doing you're you're breaking down a top the topic of gender inequality through the history of pockets. <laughs> and in the process, you are being condescended by some guy at a uniform store. It is <laughs> it is brilliant. Um there is one of my favorite podcasts uh, that I talk a lot about a lot um, is uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, yeah, Revisionist History, where he yeah. he has an episode, Paraplexics, which uh, I, among other people, consider one of the best podcast episodes ever, where he introduces an idea and then he catches uh, Sean White. Uh, of the white stripes I'm yeah, blanking yeah, yeah, on his yeah. name Jack White yeah Jack yeah. White uh, that he catches Jack White like doing the thing that he just explained and like this yes. is a very similar moment for me of your yes, podcast yes, yes. that is uh, episode three in pockets um, but don't start there start at one you'll get to three you'll get to pockets oh, you'll learn about pockets giving me so much life right now thank you <laughs> um, that's one though you gotta get two more and these are okay. not softballs okay all right, hit me. Name two of three synthetic fibers you mentioned in episode five, blue jeans that are found in denim today. Oh, lycra. Um, <laughs> uh, oh my God, I'm forgetting the technical terms for all the forms of plastic that are in jeans. I will tell you, you have lycra. You need one more. Okay, uh, lycra. And I don't know. That's the whole thing with the, with the, with the blue jeans. They're like synthetic indigo, synthetic cotton with stretch. Like, I don't even remember the names. Let's have a listen. Denim increasingly has synthetic fibers in it. Denim is not cotton anymore. Lycra, nylon, polyester. It goes by many names. But let's call it what it is. It's plastic. This is as much applicable to denim as any other part of the industry. Emma McClendon says we are at an unprecedented phase in clothing history. We've never had so many clothes available with so much plastic in them. So much plastic in jeans. I was looking for nylon, polyester, but I, now that I re-listened to it, those are just, you're saying they're synonymous with plastic. So maybe More it's bad. or less. What's that? Yeah. Uh, Bad question. Bad question. No, no, no. It's a great question. Okay. It's Nylon, a great question. polyester. What is happening here? Like, what is going to happen to jeans? What is going to happen to our jeans? And, and why should everyone only own one pair of jeans? <laughs> oh, man. I mean, the thing about jeans, right, is we think of them as these, like, hard-wearing, all-American, all-terrain vehicle things. And their design, and they were, once upon a time, they totally were. They were really sturdy. You could wear them for life. You could share them with other people. But now... I mean, those were like hard to wear in. We were like, oh, these like these are stiff and they hurt. And so then denim companies started to make jeans that are like already soft, already stretchy, already worn in to give us the look of hard wearing, authentic, mm. all terrain clothes. But they're not actually they're actually extremely cheap and they're going to. Um, I think the expert in the episode calls them weeping, yeah, weeping. where the plastic tries to like return <laughs> Over to the time, earth. Your plastic, your plastic <sighs> jeans will weep eventually, all of us. And it, it will like off gas yeah. weird things. But yeah, I like the stretch though. I like when it's clingy. So what do I do? What do I buy? Do I have to just make sure my jeans have no plastic? Um, honestly, I, so I tried to wear in raw denim jeans mm. after this, like jeans without any plastic and like definitely it sucked in the beginning, but after I would say it's like two months of wearing them, but now they feel like normal jeans. Like interesting. So denim companies are just trying to save you that initial discomfort. Mm. Um, but they're totally jeans without stretch are fine. What'd you use? What's your method? Did you get some stones or did you just washed them a bunch? I just biked everywhere. Just bike. Just, just bike. <laughs> Go buy real denim and bike in it. Forget the plastic <laughs> stuff. <laughs> All right. You got one and a half. Uh, you get this last one. And Articles of Interest is going up on the pod wall. What is spritzitura? 
Sprezzatura. I love this word. So it's good. a practiced, studied carelessness Ooh. that we see exhibited in menswear. Let's have a listen. Sprezzatura, Italian, go figure, means a studied carelessness. It's this concept that you're not supposed to look like you put a lot of effort into the way you dress, even though you probably did. Because it's not cool for men to care about how they look. That's the the spreadsheet of life. You know, you'll see a guy and you'll say, oh, well, the buttons of his shirt aren't buttoned. He knows that. He knows that. You're not telling him anything. This totally helps me explain why... I try on like four or five different items before I wear something, but I don't really want anyone to notice. Don't look at me. Don't notice yeah. me, but I want to look good for you. What is that? What's wrong with my brain? What's wrong with people? It reminds me of like kids I knew at school who would like pretend they didn't study. They'd be like, oh, I'm naturally just smart. You know, like putting in the work <laughs> is uh, degraded. You know, it's better to be like, oh, I'm just, I didn't even try. I'm just born with it. I just naturally look amazing. It's part of uh, maybe my favorite episode, the Bo Brummel episode. In the Bo Brummel episode, Suits and Menswear, uh, we learn the historical context uh, behind the men's suit, men's fashion in general. It all dates back to this guy, right, who was uh, the founding father of the suit as we know it today. And he was a paring down of like getting rid of embroidery, getting rid of all the bells and whistles from men's fashion. And it has persisted to, you know, 200, 300 years later to like menswear as we know it. You go to the Oscars, men are in one thing. Women, variety, colors, shapes, different sizes. But we as men still wear the boring old suit. Something that's actually interesting about the Bo Brummel story that didn't make the cut that I've been thinking about a lot yeah, yeah, yeah. is that Bo Brummel um, was this very, you know, he was the original dandy. He was very dashing and very handsome and everyone wanted to be like him and copy him. And then he ended up um, dying of syphilis, which is a horrible, oh. scary way to die. And actually, a portrait of Dorian Gray was written about Beau Brummel as everyone saw this this brilliant, witty, beautiful man sort of waste away before their eyes. And I mean, syphilis is, it, it's truly like the zombie disease. Like your limbs fall off, you go stark raving mad, the and brain, then you die. Yeah. Oh, no good, no good. Beau Brummel was among a cohort of extremely famous, powerful, admired men who all died of syphilis. Mm. And it created this widespread panic, this widespread fear that is not dissimilar to the AIDS crisis and not dissimilar to what we're seeing now with the coronavirus, Mm. because we think of the Victorian era as super buttoned up, like super repressed. Everyone was sort of sending these coy messages to each other and wearing gloves and like dancing far apart and sending each other flowers. So much of it was because they were scared of getting syphilis. It was like disease-based wow. culture. And the, re- the, 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 the Regency period before it was absolutely debauched, like completely, totally debauched. And so it will be interesting in cultural memory when we all emerge from this to see how we dress. We, I, to see if there will be a new sort of, yes, people are saying it might be a new 1920s, but I reckon it also might be a new sort of like age of propriety, mm. a new age of um, conservatism, maybe after some oh. like initial uh, satiation. That's and it's just interesting to yeah. see how these diseases change, fashion. Uh, how public health crises change fashion. Yeah. You know, after the 1920s, the veil was like, hanging around for a while that was like fashionable the veil like made its way in and so to your point like I see the mask is probably here right like some version of the mask is just going to be get it get a super fashionable cutesy one because it's going to be around or some version of it will be here i did a story for 99 percent invisible in taiwan a long time ago and everyone was just wearing masks not just like casually and i was there with a friend who who has been had been living in taiwan for a while and she was like oh yeah no people just wear masks i mean yeah sure it keeps you healthier but it's also in the same way that sometimes like when you don't really want to talk to anyone and you put on headphones that maybe don't even have anything playing Mm. or you're just wearing sunglasses to be like, I'm not feeling it today. The mask has also been a cultural shorthand, especially for like women who don't want to get harassed on the train Mm. to just be like, don't fuck with me. Like I can't today. I'm not feeling it. To just be like, don't, don't. And I can definitely see the mask sticking around as a cultural, like it's actually a nice thing to be able to have, to be like, I'm not in the mood. Love it. Love it. 
Love it. Yeah. Love the mask. Love running in it. It's a good little filter. Filtration keeps me warm. <laughs> Actually. I can use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. <laughs> are you in the camp that fashion will, do, do you think it gets more conservative? Truly? I just think people are going to be more okay with like joggers and underwear. But I think the other thing that I realized in making this series is that like the rules of fashion weren't made the way I thought they were made. You know, I thought they were made by these sort of like Miranda Priestley-esque figures, you know, sitting in the towers at Vogue being like, and now thou shalt not mix brown and black. And everyone would be like, oh, my God. Yes. Like, of course. Yes. That's what how fashion works. But that isn't fashion is the feeling when you look at your closet and you're like, I have nothing to wear. That's the feeling when you're like, this doesn't fit my milieu. This doesn't fit my mood. My body has changed. I have aged. I have new ideas. That's fashion. Mm. But I think the role of the gatekeepers and the influencers mm. and the editors has always been less significant than we think. Mm. I think what we've learned is these come from larger changes in economics, in gender, in um, politics. Like this is what changes fashion. Fashion is a metric of everything else that's happening in our world. I guess what you're saying is that whatever it is, it will be linked to a specific thing. Like white shoes after Labor Day was a totem of fashion, but it also had historical context that like, whatever it is, it will, it won't just come out of nowhere <laughs> to your point of your podcast. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It's going to be. And somewhere. also like, usually these things aren't even put into words. Like mm. the idea of just like, we just don't do that. Yeah. Like you don't know what the, you can't necessarily put it into words, but you know that there are rules. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You wouldn't buy a car without driving it or go on a date or two before marrying someone. So why not join me every Monday and sample a podcast or two before you make it all official and add it to your library? Commitment free, no strings attached, just you, me, and the host of an exciting new podcast. If you haven't already, please uh, leave a review on iTunes. Check out our adorable website at thepodspotter.com and tell fellow lovers of pods about what we're doing here. We're playing the field. We're listening to everything. We are potty amorous, baby. People are going to have a lot of questions coming out of this pandemic and coming out of the great pajama trend. And I feel like I need to mine the resource of Avery Truffleman right now to help folks with whatever the next wave of fashion is with maybe a little rapid fire fashion Ooh. question coming at you. Are you ready for some okay. rapid fire fashion questions to help folks thawing out after the great pandemic pajama trend? I'll try. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> What's your favorite article of clothing that you own? Oh, my old t-shirt that I've had since I was a baby. It's from the TV show, the 1960s TV show, The Prisoner. The Prisoner. Was that, mm -hmm. was that, that was that, was that a kid's show? <laughs> Your parents? No, not at all. It's uh <laughs> it's the weirdest, weirdest. I said cute and then I realized, wait a minute, show. that's called the, they dress their bit. Okay. All right. Hey. No, my did, parents. Does yeah, it look it like, like sleepwear? A, uh, no, no. <laughs> Although now, now it's super soft because I've been wearing it it's for worn in. 30 years. Yeah. yeah it's worn like those denim jeans. Uh, yeah. I'm not making this. I'm talking over the rapid fire. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, are Crocs ever acceptable if you are over seven years old and not a nurse practitioner? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Definitely. What's one trend you wish would go away? You know, I don't actually have a lot of opinions on this because I'm just kind of fascinated by all of it. Mm -hmm. I think every trend that comes up, it's just like, huh. Where did that come from? I think it's so interesting when something burbles up and you get to see where it comes from. You just want to know why. Like why? Yeah. What is the, why cargo pants? Cargo pants clearly yeah. are born out of us now carrying around pagers and cell phones <laughs> and more things, more items. <laughs> I uh, love cargo pants. What's one weird clothing obsession or eccentricity you've never told anyone? And while you think about it, I'll just tell you, our producer, uh, one of our producers was really excited to talk about his strange clothing affliction where whenever he goes on vacation, let's say he's going for three days, he has to pack three socks. And so he has to say the word socks three times, one for every day that he's going away. And in addition, he has to touch that part of his body as he says the word sock, 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 so that he makes sure 
that he packs each article of clothing specifically. Do you have any weird clothing eccentricities? <laughs> wow. No, nothing. I mean, nothing like that. Nothing like um, that. That's, that's super. Like that. you're, you're strange, Jim. I, that's really amazing, Jim. I, <laughs> I, yeah, I guess my weird superstition around clothes is like, only in the pandemic have I like bought clothes on the internet. Yeah. I very rarely do that. I like to thrift. The weird superstition I have is when I go into a thrift and I don't just go to any thrift store I find, like I have to be moved by the spirit. I very rarely like make a plan to go to a thrift store. I usually just kind of find myself there. And when I find myself in a thrift store, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I have been brought here for a reason. Mm. There's like a garment that whose path I was meant to cross and I'm not going to mm. stop looking until I find it. Like one time I was, I was reporting a story for 99% Invisible and I was in Finland and I was in this northernmost town in the winter. It was freezing. And there was this basement thrift store near my hostel that I wandered into. And it was just like huge and cavernous and cold. And there didn't seem to be much in there. Everything looked kind of like cheapy and not quite my style. But I was like, I have been brought here for a reason. I have to find, like, there's something here for me. There, there was, I was called to this location for a reason. And I think I like wandered around in the same circles for a really long time, just like over and over again, combing through all the same racks. And I eventually found this vintage Marameco coat that I wear all the time. I still wear it now. It was like meant to be like, there are some clothes that you're like, oh, you're going to be on my life journey with me. Like you are my skin, you are my protection and you will serve me well. And like, you're going to write yourself into my story. And like, that is a coat that... <laughs> Um, and so when people are like, hey, nice. And I wear it as a jacket liner. I usually wear it like under whatever jacket I'm wearing. And people are like, hey, nice jacket liner. I get a lot of compliments on it. And I always want to tell them like this weird woo woo story about like how it came into my life. But it's kind of like weird and convoluted. Well, it's good to listen to because I feel like right now we're all just like clicking around, looking yeah. at Amazon. Okay, that's five stars, thousand reviews check, put it in the cart. I feel like we can get a little more of that in there, a little more thoughtfulness into each uh, article that we purchase. Online thrifting is great. I'm a huge fan yeah, what, of online thrifting. What, 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 what are some resources for, for online thrifting? What are you using? eBay, yeah. Etsy. I love the real real, although the real real is like a little expensive, okay. but that's always been my thing. Like if you find a look that mm. you like on Instagram or even while you're scrolling around on a shopping website, I always just try to search for similar items used mm. or vintage. And usually I find like stranger, weirder stuff from like the era that that new garment is actually copying. Right. So I think it's a better way to, I mean, not only is it more sustainable to buy used, but I think you end up finding like more interesting, stranger stuff. When I think of fashionable people in my life, I think of there are people that do their thing like they have their thing yeah. or there are people who keep up with the current trends it's that's like well put kind of those two everyone kind of falls in the fashionable people kind of fall into those two things how would you promote fashion though for someone like i don't know like my dad loves tommy bahama shirts you know and he just that's fashionable for him and it works for the time and place he exists in with yeah. his other friends that wear tommy bahama shirts yeah. and he has racks of them yeah and i can't like try to convince him that it's not fashion because it is it's it makes him it is comfortable fashion. And that's so his style that's yeah, his and he cares thing about it yeah yeah it's so, beautiful is that the way into talking to people about fashion you who say that they're not fashionable is like yeah be like that is fashion like yeah. this thing that you cultivate and you care about that's totally fashion i mean i think if there's thought behind it it's fashion the thing that's hard for me is like my dad will go you know, to Kohl's and just buy a bunch of shirts in bulk. Sure. And I have, I want to be like, father, you're a father of mine. <laughs> Did you hear about Did my you, shirt story? <laughs> yeah. to me? <laughs> like, were you listening to nothing? <laughs> Bro. So I feel like that, those are the moments where I'm like, I wish, I just want, in a weird way, I make this comparison all the time. That like clothing, what we put on our bodies is not dissimilar to what we put in our bodies. Hmm. Which is not to say that I think everyone should like be a foodie, but I think it's important to like have opinions about your tastes and why you eat what you eat and to have ideas of like, do you care if it's sustainable? Do you care if it's organic? Do you not care if it's sustainable or organic? You know, like hmm. I think having opinions about how you dress is just as important. It is as important as having opinions about what you, what you eat, what and how you eat. I'm wearing a vest 
for this interview. I think I, I look, look good in vests. And yes. I have this like fantasy about, you know, being a vest guy. And I have like a vest for every occasion. But Amazing. I only own this one vest. <laughs> and I don't know why I don't just become that thing that I like. I don't know why I don't do that. But there's something. And I don't know. There's it's something not about. It's not. It's not encouraged. There's something about putting myself out there that is scary. And that like, I don't, I just don't want everyone looking at me and judging me. What is that? Totally. But, totally. But and I, the first time you do it, good. people are like, people are like, hey, look at you. Ah, like wearing a vest. And like, you don't thing. want that. No, yeah. you, don't, you don't want to. <laughs> but I think once you break past that point and people understand that you are someone who like dresses, you know, who like care, who gives a shit about what they wear, then you're free. Then you're yeah. off to the races. You can start wearing hats. You can start wearing ties. Like, I think once you, I remember this so distinctly, like when I, um, yeah, it took like a couple times of people being like, hey, look at you dressing up. Ugh. And it was like embarrassing and it made me uncomfortable and I didn't like it. But then people get over it and then you're free. Then you can, <laughs> then the whole world opens up to you and like you can you can wear fucking anything. It's awesome. So I think that's the thing. I'm trying to like come pull, come over the divide. Come over. But you get through that and then the world's your oyster and it's a beautiful, fun, exciting world. I think too, to your point on, on your pod, you talk about how fashion has been reserved, not reserved, but m moved forward by folks that are marginalized, by people that don't have a voice or don't feel like they have a voice. Um, but at the same time, you, you want to encourage everyone, you know, everyone, even if you don't feel marginalized, you know, I think yeah. I mean, maybe there's the disconnect for me there. Like I don't, I feel like I have freedom of self-expression and so maybe that's why i've never taken a, a huge interest in in, clo in 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 men's fashion or in clothing or something like that like there seems to be um a resistance for you know uh certain people to just express themselves through fashion because they don't have a need to i'm really glad you brought that up because that is a manifestation of privilege to say mm. like i don't have to try have you know to. my right. power exists in other ways like i just wear gray all day yeah and i think part of a way we can learn to listen to each other is to understand, like if we were talking about clothing as a sentence, that's a really good way to hear the people around you is to like hmm. be able to read what they are, what they are trying to say on their bodies. And I think the best way that you can become literate in a language is by learning it yourself. I think we all need to, wow. all need to understand what it means to be vulnerable, to put yourself out there, to take a to take a risk, to try something new and not sort of fall into that sacred, you know, privileged bastion of whiteness, of heterosexuality. I, I think this, which is not to say like go appropriate other cultures. I think this is all a way of finding, um, you know, find what makes you happy. Like be a vest guy if be you want to be a vest guy. guy. Yeah. Like Ro yeah. Roman Mars uses pocket square, as you mentioned on your yes. podcast. Um, yes, he's very good at it. We're not in the rapid fire uh, section anymore. We've just had a conversation. <laughs> but my last question was, do you have a Ruben Mars impersonation? Um, Most iconic voice in podcasting. <laughs> Next to Ira Glass. I feel like my whole life is a Roman Mars. Like I'm always just imitating Roman Mars, like most of the time. Except I'm just like a little, I'm like an over-enthused lady Roman Mars. Uh, Good person to emulate. That's me. Although I can do Roman Mars's impersonation of the BBC, which we used to do all the time. Yes, please. He would always say, when we were making fun of the BBC, which we used to do a lot, <laughs> he'd always be like, their leader is four years old. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> that sing-songy. Oh, that is, yeah, that's yeah. it. But Great. for now, time will tell. Go high, go yeah. low, and you can be yeah. a BBC broadcaster. That's Roman Mars imitating the BBC. Well, Avery... This has been a great conversation. <laughs> I thank go. you for your time. Uh, <laughs> it's been a it. pleasure. <laughs> yeah. um, I do ask everyone before they go for um, your uh, piece of audio you'd like inducted into the Podcast Hall of Fame from articles of interest. As people attend the Podcast Hall of Fame, that one bit of audio will play as they approach the articles of interest kiosk. Is there a moment, Ooh. a sound, anything you'd like? I mean, the pockets one is kind of the classic one that everyone nice. plays, but the one that I feel I, that that I like pat myself on the back. I'm like, good. Like that was a little journalisty what you did right there uh, is when I did a story about diamonds. I went to the diamond district and I tried to sell a um, lab grown diamond and everyone advised me not to do it. They're like, it's a waste of your time. You know, don't do it or it could get you into legal trouble. 
And um, basically just turns out these diamond sellers, I mean, I, I, I brought a pair of earrings, diamond stud earrings grown in a lab. And everyone who I brought them to tested them both and said that one was quote unquote real, as in like a natural, a mind diamond. And the other was fake. Like, what is our notion of authenticity in fashion and the value we literally ascribe to this thing that is just made up? Both jewelers told me that one earring was quote unquote real and the other was lab grown. One diamond seller offered to buy the real diamond for between five hundred to a thousand dollars. Five hundred to a thousand dollars is not chicken. nothing to sneeze at. Not chicken feed, right? And then the re- the other one you sell at a very low price. Because- like, what's a really low price for that one? Like a hundred, yeah, really? Yeah, exactly. well, it's fake. You know, it's not fake, but it's lab. Yeah. I don't know if you could hear that, but he said the lab-grown diamond would only be worth about a hundred dollars. So one earring was supposedly worth ten times more than the other. And again, I can't emphasize enough that this pair of earrings came from the same laboratory. Anything to plug? Anything uh, you're hosting at least six or seven other podcasts? I currently host the podcast, uh, The Cut, which is definitely a departure. It's definitely not like talking to nerds about nerdy things. It's definitely more about like talking about the way we live now. And it's kind of a bit, it's kind of become this like quarantine diary. Um, But, you know, I'm just working on an episode right now with Jonathan Van Ness, asking them about how to be nice. Um, in the face of a, what feels like a really cruel world when we all live on the internet. Scoop here, little uh, podcast tip, uh, Nice Try is coming back, and that hey. should be out uh, eventually. We haven't started it yet, but we will start it soon. Awesome. So yeah, so keep your eyes peeled to Nice Try. Thank you, Avery. As you know, no one listens to the last five minutes of any podcasts. You know this because you podcast... Uh, quite often by now, everyone has finished what they were doing, uh, multitasking while listening. And so no one's here. It's just the two of us. And so you can talk about whatever you'd like. Get anything off your chest. Uh, it is the last five minutes. And uh, so I use this time to, um, you know, tell off former boss, former lover, or uh, just vent about life in general. And I just want to say that I got my second dose. <gasps> uh, I know. I'm Congratulations. Vax. I'm a full vax boy. I'm That's a full, amazing. full vax boy. It was great. Little arm sore. Uh, chills the next day. Oh, some, uh, I got that Moderna, that good, good Moderna stuff. Nice. Um, but it feels really good after the first vax. I was so you, I, I will warn people you get like, you get so exuberant. Like you're just so relieved. And like, I had all this oh, weird, wow. crazy vax energy of like hope and optimism. I ended up hurting my back, like overdoing it, running, exercising. Oh. It's a miserable, miserable experience, miserable week. Second, second time, second shot. You're just gonna feel sick and kind of out of it. Uh, that's that's the that's my that's my take on the two shot experience. But I'm so excited. We're coming back. That's I know amazing. we're close. We're coming back. Share anything you want. No one's here. No one's listening. I I mean every day is the same in my world. I don't have a vaccine <laughs> in my future. I don't know. I'm just super tired. I'm super burnt out. Yeah. Um. It's really hard. It's been really hard because as you can tell. From articles of interest, so much of my work involves like going out into the world and talking to people and touching objects and like getting really excited and um, being cooped up and still having to make shows. You know, it feels like I'm like, I'm sure you feel this to a degree too. It just feels like I'm plowing a field that's just like, it's dry. Like the field needs, I'm, I'm, I've like hit my my breaking point. And so it's, it's kind of beautiful and fascinating to hear. Uh, Cause I, yeah, I haven't, I, I'm very embarrassed listening to my old stories. I haven't listened to articles of interest and hearing how like excited and enthusiastic I was. I'm like, Oh, right. That I don't really oh. relate to that person right now. It's been a long time since I've felt like that person and hearing that you have your second shot is a nice reminder. Like, Oh, maybe she'll come back. Like maybe the oh. world will allow for, th- sorry, that's kind of dark. No, that's, it's good. The, that's the truth of it. This quarantine has not been easy on extroverts, for sure. Uh, ordinarily, I would be in that boat. My wife and I are extroverts. We need to be out. We need to be with people. But we have a newborn. You know, we have a 14-month-old. So we were going to be yeah. we were going to be here anyway. We were going to be yeah. doing this yeah. no matter what. So anytime I get too antsy, I'm just like, okay, all right, calm down. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Thank you for your candor. Thank, thank you. you for all that. I learned so much today. I loved that read people's fashion, that note. Like, and I just want to make sure that I don't interpret it incorrectly. You don't mean like, um, vocally observe like, Hey, I see what you're doing there. Lapels and a zoot suit. Like you, you, you just mean 
outwardly observe, take note of it. Well, like, okay, so I'm looking at your outfit right now, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you've got a vest, which is kind of like traditionally something that you'd wear with like a suit or something kind of fancy. It's also something a little maybe old timey. It's a perfect mix of like folksy and fancy, mm. but you're pairing it with a chambray shirt, which you've unbuttoned, which definitely brings it a step to like folksier. Chambray is definitely like a working man's shirt. It definitely says like, we're here to do business. The way that you've unbuttoned it and unrolled it is like, you know, we're here to work, but we're casual, you know, like it's all good, but I put this vest on because like I care and I've dressed up and this matters. And like, that's a way of reading. And when I say read, I mean, I'm like, oh, I see the historical, the context of these items that you're pairing together. You're, you're like mixing paint. I see the message that you are sending me and I so appreciate it, you know? And I wouldn't say this to your face, but that's, you know, like when you see someone and they're wearing heels, you're like, oh, you, you dressed up, you know? Like, look at you. Like, it means, it means, it means a thing. Every, everything you're wearing means something. Um, even if you can't necessarily vocalize it or even if you don't know the history, intuitively, it means something to you. Um, you know, if I were to wear a leather jacket, you'd be like, oh, I mean, I'll show you what I'm wearing now. I'm wearing, this is extremely quarantine, right? I'm wearing Whoa. studded Whoa. Um, short shorts, sweatpants. Are there pockets in those? No, there aren't. Studded. It's very upsetting. Wow. But like, so that's like a nod to like punk and fetish. And yet it's paired with like something casual. Are there and... studs on the, on the bottom as well? You're no, not sitting no, on no, those no, things. No, no, okay, no. just the no, front can't sit on those things. <sighs> yeah. So like everything, because everything exists and it's, it's almost like when you listen to music and you're like, oh, that's kind of pop influenced, kind of country influenced. Like you can understand everything in its context. Play with paints and the is what it sounds yeah. like you're saying. Don't be afraid to play with paints. Like you have to dress. You have to dress. Avery. Thank you so much. Learned so much from oh, you, so you much so from much. your pod. This was so much fun. I get such a lift from these and, uh, and, and from great podcasts. So thank you for sharing. Burning cold with a hidden story. Bring cold on We're always looking for new suggestions on a fresh batch of pods. Please tell me what you're listening to and tell me what hosts you'd like to hear from via thepodspotter.com or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram at thepodspotter. Thank you. This has been Zach Robinos. The Pod Spotter is created by the Price Brothers, produced by Oink Inc. Radio, associate producer Tori Adams, and is recorded and produced at Baker Sound in Philadelphia. Philadelphia.